Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone and welcome to True Code's webinar today. Today we're going to be covering LTAC's long-term acute care hospitals versus LTC's long-term care or SNF coding with ICD-10. Um, we are very pleased to have Joy King Ewing with us and I'm going to introduce her in just a moment. But a few housekeeping rules before we get started. Uh, please remember that you are in listen-only mode which basically means you can't live ask Joy a question, but if you do have a question, then you can just use the control panel. At the very top of your control panel, which is on the right side of your screen, there will be a little orange rectangle with an arrow in it. If that control panel is in your way, simply click on the arrow and it'll move it out of the way for you. However, at the very bottom of the screen, you will notice there are things like questions and handouts. When you have a question for the um, speaker today or for behind the scenes, simply click on the question, little plus sign next to questions and it will um, open up a question box and then you will be able to ask questions to the presenter today. Also, if you're interested in having a copy of the handouts, right underneath the question button there is a handout button. Click on the plus sign and you'll be able to see the handouts from there and be able to get them as appropriate. Also, you will be able to get your 1CE. Uh, you will get an evaluation form that will come in the way of email and that will probably come to you tomorrow. So once you get that email, there will be an evaluation form. Please fill out the evaluation form and let us know how, how you think it went today. And and then once you send in that evaluation form, you will get your CE in your email after that. So again, that will probably come to you tomorrow. So those are some of the main things that we wanted to let you know about. Let me go ahead and introduce you to Joy King Ewing. Joy has over 20 years of experience in health information management with specialized education and experience in inpatient coding. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in Health Information Management from the University of Tennessee. She serves as a consultant for the Alabama Quality Assurance Foundation and the Florida Medical Quality Assurance for several years. She also taught coding workshops and oversaw all coding activities related to PEP under the scope of work for the Alabama Quality Assurance Foundation and she makes many presentations to medical staff across the state and she is press president of the Alabama Health Information Management Association, the distinguished member for 2003, and she has served on the CSA task force for the American Health Information Management Association. Joy works as an independent con contractor for Yes HI and consulting, and she has her own consulting firm, Joy King Consulting. She offers presentations related to clinical documentation, severity adjusted DRGs, POA indicators, and pay for performance topics related to upcoming changes in reimbursement. And we are very, very excited to have her on our TRUCO team as well. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Joy. Joy, take it away. Karen, thank you so much for that introduction, and welcome everyone. I hope you're having a, a great afternoon. As Karen said, I want to talk to you for a little while today about the differences between LTAC coding and short-term coding, LTAC coding and long-term care coding, etc. Um, if you look at any of the uh, information on LTAC hospitals on the CMS website, they basically use the acronym LTCH. Um, however, the acronym that I'm going to be using today, just to make sure that I reinforce in your mind the differences between LTAC, which is a, still an acute care type of hospital, and long-term care, I'm going to be using the acronyms LTAC with that A highlighted to remind you that it's acute care, and I'm going to be using the term SNF instead of long-term care because that's the primary care setting that um, falls into that arena and that we're going to be talking about today. First of all, to reiterate, as I said, because an LTAC hospital is also an acute care hospital, their definition of principal diagnosis is the same as a short-term uh, principal uh, acute care hospital, which is the condition established after study to be cheaply responsible for occasioning the admission of the patient to the hospital for care. In general, you're going to find that the same coding guidelines that apply to short-term hospitals also apply to LTACs. However, there are a few exceptions. The primary exception that is a pretty much a, a general exception is that when a patient is admitted to an LTAC for a CVA, rather than coding it to the acute CVA code, um, the LTAC is going to use that I-69 category that shows you any residuals that that patient has um, from that 
stroke that have to be rehabbed in the uh, LTAC setting. And that's based on a coding clinic there, fourth quarter 2003, that came out for ICD-9 coding. Also, you're going to find that there are some sequencing differences because of the fact that some things have already been treated in the LTAC, or in the short-term hospital, rather. In the um, areas of sepsis and poisonings and things like that, there are chapter-specific guidelines that um, define how those things are sequenced. If a patient comes in with sepsis or a poisoning, for example, and ends up with respiratory failure, those chapter-specific guidelines tell you to sequence the sepsis or the poisoning as a principal diagnosis in the short-term acute care hospital. However, what you're going to find is that once they become admitted to the LTAC, most of those things have already been treated prior to the uh, admission to the LTAC, so you're not necessarily going to be sequencing things the same way. Often if they've come in with respiratory failure as a result of a poisoning or sepsis, that's really what the LTAC hospital is going to be focusing on. And so in that particular case, the respiratory failure would end up being the principal diagnosis for that LTAC admission. And just to talk for a minute about the um, category of the CVA with residuals, that I-69X category, um, you know that those um, late effects that are still present, that are still being treated in the LTAC setting or the SNF setting, either one, related to that stroke are going to be um, captured in that combination I-69 code. You also know that if there are not any residuals um, present to be treated, that they're not going to be coded to that I-69 category, but instead are going to be coded to a Z code showing a history of a stroke. Also, we um, have some additional guidelines under ICD-10 related to hemiplegia, hemiparesis, and monoplegia. And when the physician documents the side that is affected but does not tell you whether it's dominant, non-dominant, et cetera, we have sort of a hierarchy that we have to go by so that the coder can go ahead and determine how to code which side it is. Obviously, an ambidextrous patient is going to default to dominant side. A left-handed person is going to default to non-dominant because the majority of patients or the people in the in the world are not left-handed, they are right-handed. And therefore, people that have their right side affected, if the doctor hasn't specified which one is dominant, you would automatically code that to dominant. Also, be aware of um, some coding clinics that came out last year that are um, giving us some additional guidance. This one was in first quarter 2015, page 25, and it has a question about a patient who came in um, with a history of acute CVA with residual right-sided weakness. And basically, the, um, it wasn't defined as hemiplegia or hemiparesis, so the question was, how would it be coded? And as you can see from the answer there, it is um, when unilateral weakness is clearly documented and linked back to the CVA, it is considered synonymous with hemiparesis or hemiplegia, and you are able to assign that category I69.351 combination code. Some of the other unique challenges for um, LTACs First of all, often when you get um, a history and physical for an LTAC admission, the physician frequently um, has documented everything that was being treated and wrong with that patient when they first got admitted to the short-term hospital. Um, and you have to sort of weed your way through a lot of those diagnoses to determine which ones of those were fully treated and resolved in the short-term hospital prior to transfer and which ones of those are still being partially treated once they are um, admitted to the, to the LTAC. Some physicians do a better job than others of kind of making that clear, but sometimes it's a little bit of a challenge for the coder to sort of walk through that documentation, figure out which things are still active diagnoses and which ones are not. In addition to that, in terms of the principal diagnosis, as I said, you have to focus on what is the reason for transfer to the LTAC for continuing care not necessarily going to be the same thing that was the principal diagnosis in the short-term hospital. We've already talked about the issues with um, sequencing, chapter sequencing guidelines for poisonings and um, things like that don't necessarily apply. So whatever acute conditions are still being treated and which one, ever one of those is the most common cause or the most likely cause of that um, transfer to the LTAC is what you're going to be um, 
assigning as the principal diagnosis for that LTAC admission. It could be an acute condition that's still being treated. It could be an aftercare code because the patient had some kind of surgical procedure in the short-term hospital that's continuing to be cared for in the LTAC. Or it could be, as I said, that CBA sequela code. The other thing that you need to be aware of is something that is unique to LTAC hospitals, which, which is what they call interrupted stays. Sometimes a patient will come into the LTAC hospital for a period of days, and then they end up having to be transferred back to the short-term hospital for maybe a surgical procedure or some kind of thing like that. And then they will come back to the LTAC to continue their care. The way that that is handled, both of those portions of that stay are billed to CMS as one episode of care. And so both of them have to be used in determining what is sequenced as the um, principal diagnosis for that whole entire stay. So that's um, a little bit tricky sometimes and something that is unique to this setting. Also be aware of the fact that it's important that you capture the resources that are being consumed in the LTAC setting. Sometimes, as I said, patients are coming in after having had a surgical procedure in the short-term hospital, and they're going to continue to have care of those surgical wounds, um, even if there's no post-op complication. So it's important to um, assign an aftercare code to reflect not only the severity and complexity of that patient's condition to show that they are just um, have just recently had a surgical procedure, but also to reflect any resources that are being used as uh, in terms of nursing care, um, changing bandages, things like that. Also be aware of the fact that if they have a peg or a trach placed in the short-term hospital and just prior to um, transfer to the LTAC, often you need to use not the status codes in the Z93 category, but those attention to codes in the Z43 category. Because frequently you will see that the, the nurses and the wound care um, people are still doing attention to those openings as they are healing during that LTAC stay. Again, a better reflection of actual resources that are being consumed on that patient. So again, just some coding tips about um, treatment for acute conditions. Um, any acute condition or post-op complication that is still requiring monitoring or care um, in the LTAC setting should be coded with an acute diagnosis code or a post-op complication code as long as that condition persists and is requiring treatment and follow-up. Do not code acute conditions that have resolved prior to admission to the LTAC. Often you will find patients that had an acute kidney injury or acute kidney failure in the short-term hospital, and the physician, when, once they get transferred to the LTAC, often the physician will still list that in the diagnosis list, but when you read through the documentation, you find that that AKI um, was actually resolved completely in the short-term hospital prior to transfer. So that would be the type of thing that you would not want to pick up a code for if they are not still treating that. Also, uh, a couple of coding clinics related to seven characters for LTAC coding. This one in um, first quarter 2015, talking about a patient that was transferred to the LTAC for removal or after removal of an infected AV graft to continue, continue treatment with IV vancomycin and also to continue human dialysis treatment. And it, the question states that it, even though the infected graft was removed at a previous encounter, um, that's for continued treatment. So are you supposed to be assigning that to initial or subsequent encounter for care? And again, let me reiterate that one of the areas that's caused a lot of confusion for people with the seventh character initial is that people are translating the word initial into first and instead of into active. So be reminded that that initial encounter really means still receiving active care. And you can see from this coding clinic answer that they have advised that you use the A for initial encounter for care because that LTAC treatment is still considered active treatment for that graft infection. This is another one um, with a similar type um, question where the patient came in to the LTAC after a two-month acute care stay for abdominal wound dehiscence. Um, they were continuing to receive treatment for the wound dehiscence, um, TPN, et cetera, in the LTAC stay. So again, they recommend that um, seventh character of A for active care for that condition. Also, the aftercare Z codes that I've already mentioned um, earlier, it's important to capture those if they are coming in status post-surgery. 
um, and try to get as specific as you can about the type of aftercare, either the type of surgery that they had or the type of aftercare or even both sometimes. Um, it's important to show that because it does, as I said, give a picture of severity of that patient as well as resource use by that patient today. And then there are some status Z codes that can be used along with those aftercare codes. You see the example here on the slide where you have an aftercare code to show that they had um, circulatory system surgery, and then you can use that status code to show that the specific type surgery they had was a cabbage. Um, there are some other history codes and status codes such as event-dependent um, category that are going to, you know, frequently appear in patients that are in the LTAC setting. Also, I think it's very important that you capture um, MRSA and drug-resistant organisms. Many of the patients that come into an LTAC setting are on long-term IV antibiotic therapy, and frequently that is because they um, have conditions or infections that are from drug-resistant organisms. So I think it's important to, to capture um, those in your coding, not only to sort of help explain why they're in the LTAC setting, but also it definitely explains the resource consumption because many times those antibiotics are much more expensive for those drug-resistant categories. Of course, you have some codes that are a combination code that capture the drug along with the conditions, such as the sepsis there due to MRSA. Then you have that B95 category, and I think B96 also, which show organism um, codes that you can use along with a, a condition or infection that they are being treated for if there's not a combination code. You also have that Z22 code there showing that they are um, a carrier or a suspected carrier of Mercer if they have uh, noted a positive navel swab or some you know situation where they have a positive um, swab for MRSA. And then you also have that Z16 category, which has greatly expanded the options that we have to code from an ICD-10 in terms of resistant um, organisms. So again, I think it's very important to try to capture any of those that might apply to your LTAC patient. Also with pneumonia, just again reminding you that we um, code those to the type of pneumonia. Uh, aspiration pneumonia is a frequent situation that you might find with LTAC patients, but again, be careful to make sure that the doctor hasn't just documented aspiration and then somewhere else in the chart documented pneumonia and not link the two together. Um, Any time that you can get the causative organism captured in the code, the better, because if you have to use those in pneumonia unspecified codes, they do not show severity, they do not group to the higher, um, more major um, pneumonia categories. Respiratory failure, obviously you want to be looking um, for acuity. Again, when you have a patient that has respiratory failure in the short-term hospital and then they are um, transferred to the LTAC setting, uh, some of them are there for being weaned from a vent, but sometimes they're, they're not, and you have to really still sort of verify that there's still some respiratory failure, acuity, and treatment going on in the LTAC setting in terms of whether to capture that code or not. Again, also be reminded that unlike in ICD-9 where unspecified and acute respiratory failure went to the same code, that is not the case in ICD-10. There is a separate code when the doctor does not specify whether it's acute or chronic respiratory failure. Frequently, of course, in the LTAC setting, you're going to find that it's going to be chronic respiratory failure, but you still need to have documentation. And then you also have that fifth character to show hypoxia or hypercapnia. Um, another little um, coding clinic guideline to, to talk about for a moment, there was a coding clinic that came out in fourth quarter 2003 related to ICD-9 coding that gave an example of a patient transferred to the LTAC for continued treatment of respiratory failure and vent weaning, and it stated to code that to chronic respiratory failure as the principal diagnosis, and then that V code for dependence on res respirator encounter for vent weaning. In ICD-10 coding, um, the coding guidelines state for encounters for weaning from a mechanical vent that you would assign a code from that J96 point one category, again, the chronic respiratory failure, and then that Z99.11 dependence on respirator as a secondary code. Another coding clinic came out in first quarter 2015 where the patient was admitted to the LTAC um, for chronic respiratory failure and vent dependency after an acute admission for an accidental drug overdose. 
And again, reminding you what I said at the beginning of the presentation, that in the short-term hospital, the drug overdose would be sequenced as the principal in that case. But in the LTAC setting, that is, uh, has already been treated in the short-term hospital. So the LTAC is actually um, treating the chronic respiratory failure. And so that would be the sequenced as the principal diagnosis for the LTAC admission. Also, diabetes mellitus. Uh, most many of the patients that you're going to be coding in an LTAC setting are diabetic and obviously the default is type 2 as a physician doesn't specify. Um, something new in ICD-10 that some coders still um, struggle with is re remembering that we can now code poorly controlled or uncontrolled diabetes to diabetes with hyperglycemia, which is a combination code. I believe it's um, if we're a type 2 E1 1.65, I believe is the code. Um, another thing is that second or that third bullet there about combination codes and the diabetes with instructions in the alpha index. This has caused some confusion and in fact we're going to talk in just a moment about some coding clinics that have come out to clarify that. But make sure that you pay close attention to that when you're assigning those diabetes codes where they have associated or potentially associated instructions because we're able to make that link now with those combination codes without physician documentation um, more than we were able to under ICD-9. Also, the diabetic ulcer codes, remember that those, um, unlike the pressure ulcer codes, those require that L code, either L97 or L98, and they have to actually um, be broken down by the site and depth of that ulcer. And unlike pressure ulcers, they don't often have wound care nurses staging those non-pressure ulcers, and so the documentation often is lacking about how to capture the um, ulcers, and that can have a huge impact on the length of stay in the LTAC setting and the resource consumption. So it's something that needs to be worked on and addressed if you aren't finding the documentation that you need for those codes. Make sure you capture any patient noncompliance with um, diabetic diet or insulin, and also make sure you use that Z79 if they are on long-term insulin. Again, this came out in first quarter um, 16, and I happen to have uh, an advanced look at second quarter 16. They have addressed it yet again because apparently a lot of people had questions about the fact that when it says diabetes with, and it has things underneath there like chronic kidney disease, polyneuropathy, um, peripheral vascular disease, et cetera, that we can automatically um, link those and use those combination codes even if the physician did not link them in the documentation. It does go on to state at the bottom of this um, coding clinic answer, of course, that if the doctor specifically unlinks them, if, if he specifically states that the diabetes is not the underlying cause, then certainly you would not code that combination code. A um, couple of other things to point out about diabetes that are kind of new to ICD-10. Again, you see the diabetic um, code with the foot ulcer, the combination code there, and the additional L code that I've talked about. But something that I wanted to, to make sure I pointed out as well, in ICD-9, the word necrosis did not code to gangrene, but it does in ICD-10. So if you see that documented um, with a diabetic ulcer, which is pretty frequent, be aware of the fact that that is going to be coded to that E11.52 code. Uh, depending on if it's type 2 or type 1, it would be E10, with diabetic peripheral angiography with gangrene. Also, I talked already about the poorly and uncontrolled diabetes combination code. And then there was a coding clinic that came out in first quarter 16 related to diabetic foot ulcers that again reiterates the fact that in this particular situation here, the foot ulcer, the polyneuropathy, and the ESRD are all conditions that are listed in the alpha index under diabetes with. So the, doc, the um, coding clinic reiterates the fact that ICD-10 does assume a cause and effect between those conditions, and you are allowed to use those combination codes. Also be aware of the fact that unlike ICD-9, where osteomyelitis was assumed to be a cause and effect with, between diabetes and, and osteo, they have unlinked that for ICD-10. In this um, coding clinic that came out, and the first one came out in fourth quarter 2013, and then another one in first quarter 2016, stating that I-10 does not presume a cause and effect or a link between diabetes and osteomyelitis, and that you would not code osteomyelitis as a diabetic complication unless the provider specifically links the two in the documentation. A couple of coding scenarios to just um, work through here quickly. 
This patient was admitted to the LTAC following hospitalization for acute osteomyelitis and gangrene from a chronic non-healing decubitus ulcer stage four of the left heel. Um, Long-term antibiotic therapies continue for the osteomyelitis in the um, heel and for the stage two pre left buttock pressure ulcer. Patient also has type one diabetes with peripheral vascular disease, stage four chronic kidney disease, hypertension, and is also status post um, right AKA. And then you also see past history um, diagnoses listed there. And in the LTAC setting, um, you are basically going to, you know, code those out just um, pretty much like you would in a short-term hospital. That M86 code down there is the acute osteomyelitis code. The L89 is showing the um, um, ulcer. And um, you've got two ulcers basically going on there, the stage four of the heel and the stage two of the, of the buttock. And then you have the... Um, E10.51, which is the type 1 diabetes with the um, peripheral vascular disease combination code. And then you also have the uh, E10.22, which is a combination code type 1 diabetes with CKD. The N18 to show the stage of the CKD, that hypertension combination code. And then you have um, that um, M1A. 0.9XX1 to show the gout with TOFI. And you also have the hypercholesterolemia, the CAD, um, the chronic alcohol, alcoholism and remission, and then the status post AKA are all captured in that LTAC um, situation. Non-pressure ulcers, as I said, in ICD-9 were coded to the site, and in ICD-10, they actually show the depth of the ulcer. Um, Often I find that unspecified severity is used frequently because we don't have the documentation that we need to classify those appropriately. And again, those are often really bad ulcers in LTAC patients, and it's really important to try to capture the depth and the complexity of that ulcer, if possible, in the codes. Also be reminded that when you're talking about um, coding these, that skin and subcutaneous tissue are separate body parts in ICD-10 PCS for debridement, unlike in ICD-9 where all of that was rolled into one code. Another scenario here is a patient with type 2 diabetes and a chronically infected ulcer of the left midfoot. Um, diabetic foot ulcer with skin breakdown, positive for MRSA, polyneuropathy, ESRD on hemodialysis. And you see the codes down at the bottom for each of those conditions. Again, talking about pressure ulcers in ICD-9, we had one code for the site and one for the stage, and then we had debridement and skin and subcutaneous tissue were rolled together. In ICD-10, we have combination codes that show the site and stage in a combination code with the final character um, showing the stage of the pressure ulcer. And we also, as I said, in debridements have to clarify the difference between skin or subcutaneous tissue and fascia. Also, this just came out in first quarter 2016, which is kind of an eye-opening um, coding clinic. It talked about a patient who came in from the acute care to the LTAC with ongoing treatment of C. diff, COPD exacerbation, and asthma. And the doctor documented um, sepsis as one of sepsis resolving as one of the diagnoses. Is it appropriate to assign a code for resolving sepsis in the LTAC setting? Does it matter if the patient is on antibiotics or not? And the answer there, which was a little bit surprising to some of us who have been working with LTACs, is the patient is no longer actively septic, so instead code the underlying infection that triggered the sepsis, such as C. diff, pneumonia, or pyelonephritis. If it's not clear whether the patient is still septic or not, query the physician for clarification. One of my concerns about that um, also is the fact that often they aren't going to tell you what the original condition was necessarily that caused the sepsis. And for an LTAC setting patient, it's um, even more unclear sometimes than it is in the short-term hospital. So this is going to be something that LTAC coders are going to have to kind of grapple with a bit. For injuries, um, again, you're, we're no longer coding the V57 codes, um, and we are having to code the injury with the seventh character, and probably the A. Um, just as we did with the post-op complications for initial or active ca care for that injury. Again, you would have to verify that with your documentation and your chart. And the same thing for fractures. We're going to code V57 
the original fracture with that seventh character probably for A for the initial episode or active care for that fracture um, rather than coding an aftercare code. And then non-traumatic fractures, we do have that M80 osteoporosis with a current fracture. Um, if they have known osteoporosis and have a fracture that would nor not normally break a healthy bone, that you can use that combination code. And then an M84 category for a pathological fracture without osteoporosis documented. A few other Z codes that apply to the LTAC setting are on this um, slide here, some of which I've already addressed. Um, acute MI, obviously we have a different time frame, um, not eight weeks um, or less for an acute MI, but four weeks or less. And of course we have that additional um, I-22 code if they have a new subsequent MI within the same time frame of uh, four-week time frame of the original MI that we have two separate codes to use. And then we have that I-25.2 code for old MIs. Again, some coding guidelines related to that subsequent uh, AMI are listed here in terms of how that would be coded and the fact that um, the sequencing of the I-22 and the I-21 would be based on the circumstances of the encounter that you're coding. And just quickly to talk about a couple of PCS procedures, you don't have a lot of procedures that are actually done in the LTAC setting. But debridement is certainly one of those. An excisional versus non-excisional debridement is one of those issues that we have to address. Um, third quarter coding clinic of 2015 has a lot of examples about excisional and non-excisional. And it basically has said that any documentation by the physician needs to have the word excision in it, and it needs to have scalpel. Um, other instruments, such as scissors or other um, sharp instruments, if, even if they say they cut with those, they're kind of eliminating those from an excisional debridement um, situation. So it's going to be really important that we try to capture what we need for an excisional debridement. And of course, the depth of the, of the debridement needs to be clear by the physician. And again, the reminder about the skin and subcutaneous being different body parts. For endoscopic procedures, um, sometimes you'll have those in the L LTAC setting and you need to understand um, based on the documentation what the intent of that procedure was, whether it was a biopsy, inspection, drainage, etc. If you look at coding clinic third quarter 2015 and first quarter 2016, there are several examples related to these issues that help clarify you for you when width root operation is used when. So I would remind you to um, familiarize yourself with those for any areas that you find you're having to code fairly frequently. Also that last bullet down there talking about the type of contrast used, whether it's low or high or lower, is something that you're going to find in some of these uh, endoscopic procedures. And the biopsy issue, who would think that, that a biopsy would be so complex to code in a CD10 PCS, but you do have to determine um, whether they actually did um, excise illusion for a diagnostic biopsy or whether it was a therapeutic removal um, based on the intent expressed by the physician and that sometimes is clear and sometimes it is not. You also have to look at the operative approach and the specific anatomic site for that biopsy or excision of lesion. Now I want to switch gears and talk about SNF or long-term care coding with ICD-10. And before I go into that, I just want to briefly comment on the fact that my um, association with SNF co coders and coding is um, the SNFs that I have had anything to do with do not have trained coders actually assigning codes. They um, often use the RNs that fill out the MDS assessment for a um, skilled nursing patient because that has a lot to do with the rug classification that determines payment. And as a result of that, um, they often don't have access to encoders and they often don't have access to the official coding guidelines for coding. And I just want to reiterate for you, um, if you happen to find yourself in that situation, that the HIPAA uh, legislation does require that skilled nursing facilities follow all the guidelines for coding with I-10-CM, including the official guidelines for coding and reporting and the coding clinics that provide interpretation and advice. And that can be a real problem if you don't have access to those things as a matter of course or have trained coders assigning those codes. But please be aware of the fact that that is the expectation um, from CMS and the, and the other payers out there. 
Also be aware of the fact that skilled nursing coding is unique because the residents remain after their initial episode of illness in many cases. And all of the I-10 diagnosis codes that are assigned um, are done at different times. They are assigned when the patient is first admitted to the skilled nursing facility and then concurrently as they're living there and different things arise during the stay or when they um, have to update the MDS, different new diagnoses will have to be added. Everything that is affecting that resident's care should be coded per the coding guidelines for skilled nursing facilities. The diagnosis list that is maintained in the skilled nursing facility and the sequencing of all of that varies depending on the circumstances of whether the patient is newly admitted or whether it's a readmission um, after a short-term hospital stay, etc. You can see there are not a whole lot of coding clinics um, with guidelines for skilled nursing or long-term care coding. The ones that primarily address that are listed at the bottom of that slide for you. Also be aware of the fact that the definition of principal diagnosis for skilled nursing facilities was expanded um, beyond that of a short-term hospital or an LTAC hospital. And basically coding clinic states that for residents who continue to stay in a skilled nursing facility, the condition requiring them to continue to stay would be what you would sequence first as the principal diagnosis. Coding and sequencing guidelines and conventions in ICD-10-CM do take precedence over that definition. Um, also be aware of the fact that current SNF residents who are admitted to a hospital for acute conditions such as pneumonia and then come back to that skilled nursing facility for further care of their chronic conditions such as COPD um, will probably continue to receive care for the acute condition for a period of time. In this particular little scenario here, um, the principal diagnosis, which is the reason why the patient continues to live in the skilled nursing facility, is the COPD. The pneumonia is going to be coded for as long as it continues to receive care once the patient is back, but it would not be sequenced as the principal diagnosis when they return back after a short-term hospital stay. Also, um, the Medicare Program Integrity Manual refers to what they call the primary diagnosis, which is the one that is the reason for the therapy that they're receiving, the OT, PT, um, um, ST, etc. That diagnosis is the medical diagnosis that is the basis, basis for the therapy evaluation and plan or care. And it may or may not be the same thing as the principal or first listed diagnosis, which is the reason that they were admitted to or are continuing to reside in the skilled nursing facility um, as sequenced on the UBO4. The therapy evaluation and plan of care says that the medical reason to support the therapy services needs to be documented by the physician and it may or may not be identified as the primary or medical diagnosis on the treatment plan. It may or may not be the same as the reason for the continued stay or the principal diagnosis. So again, for patients who have been living in the skilled nursing facility, go to a short-term hospital or an LTAC and get readmitted, the principal diagnosis is going to be the primary reason that the patient is returning to or remaining in that facility. And that may or may not be the reason for their Medicare coverage for the skilled services that they are receiving. In addition to that, um, in terms of the coding of secondary diagnosis in the skilled nursing facility, any newly diagnosed conditions um, or other conditions that reflect services provided, monitored, treated, carry a risk of death, or et cetera, are going to be coded and listed after the principal diagnosis to include anything that is affecting that resident. Do not list diagnoses that are not pertinent to that skilled nursing stay. Do not list diagnoses that have been resolved or are history codes unless they have some clinical significance to the staff that are taking care of that patient. And unlike the um, short-term hospital stay or the LTAC stay, you do not code conditions that are documented as suspected, rule out, or probable in the skilled nursing facility setting. So basically the way the coding process should normally work in the skilled nursing facility setting is that code should be assigned um, when the patient is first admitted for the first time to the skilled nursing facility. And then as they stay in the facility, um, as you review um, things, as you review the, the MDS, um, if they get readmitted after a 
um, stay in a short-term hospital or a, an LTAC. Anytime they develop a new problem that, and a new diagnosis arises, code should be assigned so that at any point in time your diagnosis list is a reflection of all the current conditions that are impacting that patient. You need to make sure again that that diagnosis list includes all the reasons, all the medical diagnoses or reasons for the therapy and services that are being provided. And you need to make sure that that diagnosis list is, is kept up to date. And the best way to do that is to at least look at it quarterly when the MDS has to be updated and reviewed. But for um, patients that are receiving skilled or managed care, monthly is really um, preferable to review that diagnosis list and eliminate things that are no longer being treated um, and making sure that things that are being treated are added appropriately. The codes that go on the MDS and the UBO4 and in the medical record all need to support medical necessity, the skilled services that are being provided, and therefore the rug selection, which is the ultimate um, thing that determines the payment for that skilled nursing facility. The diagnosis list, as I said, is a comprehensive list and it's important to keep it updated. Um, there's, there's sort of a triple check process that works well where you validate that the I-10 codes that are on the UBO4 um, are supported by the medical record documentation and the MDS information, that they do support the therapy that is being billed on that particular UBO4, that the reimbursement is going to be based on the rug category that comes from the MDS data. The principal and secondary diagnosis would be located in form locator 67 on the UBO4. And the order of the secondary diagnosis on that bill doesn't have to match the order of the comprehensive diagnosis list that the RUG maintains, or not the RUG, but the skilled nursing facility maintains. Secondary diagnoses have to be provided to provide that medical necessity, as I already said, and they should be listed following the reason for continued stay in the facility, which is the principal diagnosis. Any other chronic conditions that affect the resident should be added, and then you also have, as we've said, the Z codes, injury and traumatic fracture codes, status codes, etc. Or acute condition codes to include in that. The way that things are sequenced on the on the bill is um, a little bit different because you do have to sequence it based on the official coding guidelines for I-10 and sequence them appropriately and make sure that um, everything that justifies the services being billed is there. Not all the diagnoses that are on the MDS are going to be put on or appropriate for the bill itself. And also the time frame for the bill versus the time frame of the MDS is going to be different. So you have to pay attention to what you're putting, what code you're putting on that bill based on the time frame that that bill covers. Again, a sequencing example, this patient was a resident in the skilled nursing facility for Parkinson's disease. They went into the hospital for pneumonia and then returned to the skilled nursing facility. Pneumonia is the medical diagnosis that is going to support the therapy treatment plan for that um, skill service along with the diagnosis. But the principal diagnosis is going to be the Parkinson's because, as I said, that is the reason why the patient is continuing to reside in the skilled nursing facility. That will be sequenced first on the record and on the UBO4. And the, the pneumonia will be listed as a secondary diagnosis as long as it's requiring active treatment. Second example, a patient fell in um, had a fracture of the wrist, was transferred to the hospital for care of that. After he returned, he was um, a resident in the skilled nursing facility because of Alzheimer's disease. He was going to be receiving OT um, for the uh, wrist fracture. Again, the principal diagnosis is going to be the Alzheimer's because that is the reason why the patient is residing in the skilled nursing facility. And the secondary diagnosis would be that wrist fracture as long as that patient is receiving active treatment for that fracture. This last little, again, warning uh, to you about um, being able to follow correct coding guidelines. The OIG, as part of their compliance program for nursing facilities, is focusing their attention more on steel nursing facilities than in the past. And they are um, looking to see that there is ongoing training and evaluation of staff responsible for coding diagnoses and that regular internal audits of coding policies and procedures are occurring. Um, they're going to be looking at consolidated billing in the new coding systems and making sure that these are done in the appropriate manner. So it's important that if you don't have trained coders or encoders available to you that you figure out ways to 
make sure that your staff are trained appropriately and that some way they are able to gain access to the coding clinic guidelines um, that are out there. So a couple of little scenarios to walk you through in the last few minutes here. Again, for, for aftercare for injuries, you no longer are going to use that B57 code when they come in for rehab in a skilled nursing facility. You would be coding it to the original injury. And in the skilled nursing facility, unlike the LTAC, you would be using that seventh character G for subsequent encounter for care. Same thing with the fracture. You're not going to use an aftercare code. You're going to code the original fracture. And again, you're going to use that subsequent episode of care um, seventh character to show the status of the healing fracture. There are some other aftercare codes in the Z category for non-fracture related orthopedic aftercare that might apply in the SNF setting at certain points in time. This coding clinic that came out in first quarter 2015 also has been somewhat problematic for uh, hospitals and skilled nursing facilities. It basically says that you are not uh, really supposed to refer to previous encounters to get the documentation needed to assign the original injury or fracture code, that you have to have enough documentation of the original injury or fracture in your episode of care that you're coding for in order to code that appropriately. And that isn't always available like we need it to be um, in some of these after uh, long-term care settings. Again, just to show you the difference between rehab and I-9 and what it looks like in I-10 with in terms of aftercare or the original fracture, fracture or injury code. Another scenario here was a patient who came into the skilled nursing facility post-hospitalization for acute coronary syndrome, which was diagnosed as an acute non-STEMI 10 days ago. That falls within that um, acute uh, AMI category of four weeks or less. Um, the patient also had a PTCA with a stent previously, um, did the CAD, hypertension, dyslipidemia, glaucoma, and has hearing aids in um, both ears. And you can see the, the codes listed down at the bottom there for that scenario. The I21.4 code is for the non-STEMI, uh, acute non-STEMI. The I25 code is for the uh, coronary artery disease. I10 is for the hypertension, the E78 for the dyslipidemia the H40.9 for the glaucoma, the H91.93 for the hearing issue, and the Z code to show that they are status post PTCA with a stent. This patient came to the skilled nursing facility after treatment of an acute CVA. The patient made a complete recovery from the CVA prior to the skilled nursing facility admission. Um, she was also diagnosed with progressive dementia, CAD, and CHF. And because of her deteriorating status and chronic medical conditions, she was transferred or admitted to the skilled nursing facility. In this particular case, um, the principal diagnosis could be any of those chronic conditions that are identified there because the CVA was resolved in the short-term hospital stay with no residuals, so there's no I-69 category uh, code or combination code to show for that. So that F03 is the dementia code, the I50.9 is the heart failure, I25 is the CAD, and then we also have that um, Z86 code for showing a history of a CVA without any residual deficits. And you see the coding clinic reference there um, from that, for that scenario. This one is a patient who came in with acute CVA and does have residual aphasia and right hemiplegia on the dominant side. She was admitted to the skilled nursing facility um, for OT, PT, and ST, and also has these chronic conditions listed on the slide for you. In this particular case, the principal diagnosis is going to be that I-69 combination code. Since you have two residuals, um, aphasia and right hemiplegia, either one of those could be listed as the principal diagnosis in this case. And then the um, I-48.2 is the chronic atrial fib. I-10 for hypertension, and E11.9 for the type 2 diabetes. Well, my slides are not moving for some reason. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Um, Again, reminding you that if they come into the skilled nursing facility and are still being treated for some acute conditions, 
that you would code those as long as they are continue to be monitored or treated um, and require some type of follow-up. Those should be assessed when you at least assess the MDS to see if they are still being treated or if they need to be taken from the diagnosis list because they have been resolved. And as I already said, if you have any acute conditions that were treated in the LTAC or the short-term hospital prior to admitted admission to the SNF, you would not assign codes for those. Another scenario is a patient who came in for OT and PT after a prolonged stay at the LTAC where the patient was weaned off the vent. At the skilled nursing facility, the patient was receiving rehab due to deconditioning and debility. The physician documented that the patient had complex medical problems, including hypoxic chronic respiratory failure requiring supplemental oxygen, COPD, a trach, type 2 diabetic neuropathy, and obesity. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see the um, code assignment for that. The J96 is the chronic respiratory failure with um, hypoxia. And the J44 is the COPD. The E11.40 is the type 2 diabetic neuropathy. Um, the E66.9 is the obesity. The Z99 category is dependence on oxygen. And then the Z93 shows the trach status. Another example is a patient who is a resident because of MS, um, but was readmitted to the short-term hospital for a UTI due to E. coli and has a history of recurrent UTIs with long-term antibiotic therapy prophylaxis. So again, reminding you that in this case, the principal diagnosis is going to be why the patient is residing in the skilled nursing facility, which in this case is the MS, and that's the G35 code you see at the bottom. The N39 code is for the urinary tract infection. The B96 captures the E. coli causative organism. And the Z87.440 um, is capturing the patient's history of recurrent UTIs, and that's something that I think is important to capture with um, skilled nursing facility patients because they that frequently is a reason why they end up being readmitted to a short-term hospital and often even developing sepsis. So it's important to show that they have a history of, of UTIs um, going in the past. And then that Z79.2 is showing that they have they are on long-term antibiotic therapy. Um, you can see that the um, information on the skilled nursing facility portion of this presentation was taken from a practice brief that was um, printed in a HEMIS journal entitled ICD-10-CM Coding Guidance for Long-Term Care Facilities. And there is also a document uh, entitled Assigning the Principal Diagnosis by Mary Leonard that was written related to that. As I said, there is not a lot of guidance out there for skilled nursing facilities in the same way that there is for uh, acute care hospitals. So you have to um, you know, find every bit of guidance that you can Along with that practice brief, they do have a lot of coding scenarios that give you examples um, of you know, things that the patient had and how to code those. So it can be a very helpful um, document to try to get your hands on. Um, and you may be able to, to uh, just Google that and, and get some of that information that way. So with that, um, I. I'm concluding my um, presentation. I don't know if um, there were any questions or not, but certainly if you have any that you want to address. Joy, actually there are a couple of questions. Okay. Okay. A couple of questions about the different types of units. People had a lot of questions on that. For example, they use terms like hospitals having transitional care areas or like swing bed admissions. There was a, a, a critical access hospital that transferred to swing bed, and they just want to know where those fit. Are those SNFs or those LTACs? Um, can you give them any kind of guidance on that or what to look for when, with these different terms that are used out there? Yeah. Um I, I think usually if you have an LTAC unit on your hospital, it will be clearly identified as an LTAC unit or a hospital within a hospital. And I didn't, I did not actually um, look that up recently, but I'm pretty certain that a swing bed is going to be more like a SNF. You're going to follow the guidelines for a skilled nursing facility bed for that. Um, I'm pretty certain. But I can certainly identify that and make sure that gets sent out if that's if I'm not correct about that. 
I think you're right on that. When I used to work in the hospital, we had a swing bed. You, you know, we had swing beds, and they were considered to be sniff beds. But yeah. that'd be great too. And what about the like transitional care? Do you know what those are normally? I don't really know what those are normally. So I guess you would have to, you know, that possibly could be an LTAC um, unit. But I really, without, I think that would. I don't think that's like a standard um, definition out there. You know, I think it would be dependent on that particular hospital and how they were using that transitional unit. So I'm afraid I really, without doing some research, I can't answer that off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another one. When you were talking about excisional debridement a few minutes ago, uh, one person says, I have a physician documenting excisional debridement when he uses a curette only. Wound margins do not change, but they always bleed. Is this still considered excisional? Do you have a thought on that? Well. Usually, uh, of course, if the, if the doctor documents it as, as an excisional, um, technically, coding clinic says that's okay. But when you're talking about a curette, it doesn't really matter so much that the wound margin didn't change. But if you're talking about a curette, um, as I said, up until third quarter 2015, I would have said yes, that probably would be fine. But after they came out in those examples in third quarter 15 where they basically say it requires a scalpel, uh, I really am not sure what I would tell you about that. What do you think, Karen? Um, yeah, I'm not sure either. I think we can do some research possibly to find out Absolutely. You know, on that. But I know that there's been some coding clinic articles about um, excisional debridement with ICD-10 PCS, so you might want to check those as well, because I remember just looking at one just the other day that gave a little bit of information. And I think, in ex actually, it gave some information, but it also said if the doctor says excisional debridement, it was okay to code it as that. So I was kind of interested in that uh, part of the official coding, or it was in the... Um, it was in a coding clinic article. So. Well, actually, as I said, that third quarter 2015 has multiple examples about excisional and non-excisional, and that's where it basically said that about the word excisional, but it also said that about the scalpel. So definitely you need to, to work your way through all of those examples and see what you think. I've heard some um, educational sessions on this issue from someone that has done the AHIMA training academy, and she it was frustrating because it, it just kind of muddied the water a little bit more than it helped clarify things. All right. That's always fun. I think we're just about out of time, Joy. Thank you so much for sharing this information. By the way, just to remind everyone that you will be getting an email tomorrow um, that will give you an evaluation form. Once you fill that out, you will then be sent a C certificate. If you have multiple people that are in the room with you, please let us know that um, and we will be able to get them or we'll tell you what to do about getting CE certificates for other people that are with you if they did not uh, register on their own there. So we'll be glad to get that to you. Remember also there will be a recording link. We will send you that information out as well to the recording from today. And again, remember the handouts are available for you on the slide. Um, I think we may have had a few more questions. We will go through those and we'll try to get back to you all as quickly as possible. Again, thank you so much, Joy. Thank you so much, everyone, for taking time out of your day today. And we are just so pleased to be able to provide this um, from TrueCode. Uh, we are just excited to have you guys with this today. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Karen.